Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lucy Pao. She's the Professor of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering. Uh, she's won a number of awards. Um, I don't think I can list them all, but she won the Nyquist Lecture Award uh, from the ASME. Um, she's a Oh, uh, an NSF career award winner, ONR Young Investigator Proposal winner, a number of other awards. Um, I think you won the A squared, C squared Control Engineering Practice Award. So she's worked on things all the way down to atomic force microscope scale, all the way up to wind turbines. So many orders of magnitude there. And today she's going to tell us some of our great work in offshore wind turbines. I think. So. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Pete. Yeah, thanks uh, everyone. For coming. It's really been a pleasure here today. I really enjoyed talking with uh, uh, a number of you uh, throughout the day. Uh, so as Pete mentioned, I'll be talking about control of floating offshore wind turbines. And what I thought I would first do is kind of give you a quick overview of sort of where we are in terms of installed wind power capacity. So over the decade from 2012 through the end of 2021, the average annual growth of installed wind power capacity worldwide uh, was about 13% per year. And so we're now at about, or at the end of 2021, there was about 839 gigawatts of installed wind power capacity worldwide. So by country, which country do you think has the most installed wind power capacity? Anyone? China, definitely. Yeah, by far. Um, so China uh, uh, has about 40% of the world's installed uh, wind power capacity. Which country do you think is number two? USA. US is number two. Um, and so China actually surpassed US in 2011. Uh, and number three is Germany. And so together, um, China, US, and Germany have over 60% of the world's installed wind power. This chart shows the top 10 countries, and we also have about a fifth of uh, the world's installed wind power uh, elsewhere in, in many other countries. All right, now in terms of wind energy penetration, Denmark is the number one country. So 44% uh, of Denmark's electrical energy needs are met with wind energy. Um, so China, for all its installed uh, wind power, uh, it has very large population, so very large electrical demand, and so they're only at about maybe 8% uh, wind penetration. The U.S. Uh, is much smaller in population, but unfortunately we tend to be energy hogs, so we're only at about 9% of our electrical energy needs being met by wind. And Germany is above 20%, so in general, European countries do quite well. But part of the point here is that there's still a lot more room for growth for wind. Now, why is there interest in offshore wind energy? Well, if we look at this wind map of uh, the United States, we see there's very good wind in the center of the country, and that's indeed where a lot of wind farms have been uh, developed. Um, but some of the best winds are actually just off the coasts and also over the Great Lakes. Uh, so there's higher stronger, more consistent winds offshore. There's also uh, large uh, population centers on the coasts. And once we go offshore, there are fewer limitations on turbine size. So in fact, the largest turbines available are installed offshore. Now, how much offshore wind does the US have? Does anybody know? Is there an offshore wind farm at all in the US? Does anyone know? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? <laughs> Who thinks no? More people think no. Okay, so there is one small offshore uh, wind farm. It's 30 megawatts. That's five, six megawatt turbines. A pretty small offshore wind farm off of Block Island, which is off the coast of Rhode Island. There's also a demonstration so that the Block Island wind farm uh, became operational in 2017. And then it, in 2021, there's a demonstration uh, site off the coast of Virginia that has two six megawatt turbines. Now, there are two projects that are under construction right now that are much larger. Um, so Vineyard Wind is expected to be 800 megawatts when it's uh, complete. And so these are size scaled by the, the capacity. And then South Fork, which is off of Long Island, will be about 130 
uh, megawatts. And so uh, when those are done and operational, the US will have almost one gigawatts of uh, offshore wind. There's a lot more in the pipeline. It is coming. It is uh, going to come very quickly. All right, so now let's look at the growth of offshore wind power. So over the same decade, uh, the worldwide annual growth in offshore wind has been 33%, so quite a bit faster compared to overall wind uh, growth. Now, which country do you think is, oh, so before getting to that, so right now we have uh, over 50 gigawatts of offshore wind, and so that's 6% of the overall wind uh, installed. Now, which country do you think is number one in offshore wind? What? There's an Amanda, right? Netherlands. Okay, they're in the top six. Denmark. Denmark, I don't believe is in the top. Well, maybe they might be in the top six. Norway. We'll, we'll find. Norway might be in the top six as well. I have to look forward, uh, but not number one. So China is number one. Again, uh, they became number one at the end of 2021. Look how much they installed in 2021. So what country is number two and was number one until 2021? Spain. And not Spain. Portugal. Not Portugal. <laughs> no, the United States only has 42 megawatts installed. So uh, and we're on gigawatt scale here. Uh, UK. UK, yes. So UK was the leader until 2021. Uh, and number three, again, here is Germany. And so uh, if we look at, uh, so the, the, the average annual growth uh, varies a lot in part because there was hardly any, you know, 10 years ago. Now, the percent of offshore wind as a function of uh, all wind in these countries varies a lot as well, depending on size of country, amount of coastline, and good wind resource offshore. So UK has nearly 50% of its uh, wind power capacity offshore. So these three countries, plus Netherlands, Denmark, and Belgium, so Denmark is among there, uh, are six dominant countries in offshore wind right now. And there's very little other offshore wind around the world for now. But that's going to change very quickly. So there are several other countries that are expected to have more than three gigawatts of offshore wind commercially in operation within the next four years. So US is expected to have more than 12 gigawatts installed offshore in commercial operation in less than four years. It's hard to believe. Um, a number of other, other countries uh, following suit here. And so we're really just at the beginnings of kind of this big offshore growth in wind power capacity. All right, so uh, let me point out some of the key components of wind turbines. This is a land-based wind turbine. It's a photograph of a 1.5 megawatt wind turbine that's located at the National Renewable Energy Labs National Wind Technology Center, which is just seven miles south of my campus here. So this is a traditional three-bladed upwind turbine. The wind is coming in from the left. There are three blades. They are connected to the hub and the hub is mounted on the nacelle, which houses also the generator. And then the nacelle is on top of the tower and the tower is mounted into a foundation, which for land-based turbines is a non-trivial amount of concrete. These are typically uh, 10 meters wide or more in diameter for the foundation. All right, so I have a model turbine here. I'll pass it around just for fun. <laughs> okay. How deep is a 10 meter wide foundation? How, what? How deep do they have? There are several meters deep. I actually don't know, but, but, but uh, multiple meters deep. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So when we go offshore, there are a number of different configurations, largely split by being either shallow water, fixed bottom, or deep water floating. So more than 99% of existing offshore wind turbines 
are shallow water fixed bottom turbines where the wind turbines are built all the way down into the seabed. Now, when we get to deeper water, typically kind of greater than 60 meters deep, then it doesn't make economical sense to build the wind turbines all the way down into the ocean floor. Then it becomes more economical to have a floating platform. And so once you have these floating platforms, both the wind and the waves will kind of impact uh, the motion of the turbine, cause oscillations, and there definitely are control challenges. All right, so where is uh, floating offshore wind so far. Okay, so globally, the majority of offshore wind resource is actually over deep water. So it's expected that eventually there will be as much or more floating offshore wind power capacity uh, compared to uh, fixed bottom uh, shallow water capacity. And right now um, there is, or at the end of 2021, I think that's largely true still right now, there's uh, only 123 megawatts of installed floating wind power. So earlier we were talking about gigawatts, right? So um, there's 840 gigawatts of installed wind power worldwide at the end of 2021 and 50 gigawatts of offshore wind power. So very small uh, percentage that's floating wind. So uh, where's floating wind being considered? So nearly all of our West Coast is going to be floating wind, because it's mostly deep water, Northeast, uh, U.S. is also deep water. Off of Hawaii is mostly deep water. And the Great Lakes is actually mostly deep water and has very good wind resource. Uh, in South America, uh, floating offshore wind is first initially being considered largely off the coast of Brazil. There's a lot of activity uh, developing in Europe as well as Southeast Asia. So these existing floating uh, wind farms there are uh, three that are in full commercial operation. They're small. Um, so in 2017, High Wind Scotland, off the coast of Scotland, uh, came into uh, operation. That's 30 megawatts. It's also five, six megawatt turbines. And then uh, Wind Float Atlantic uh, became operational in 2020. That's off the coast of Portugal. That's three 8.4 megawatt turbines. And then in uh, 2021, Kincardine off the coast of Scotland as well uh, became operational. And that's a 50 megawatt uh, wind farm of six turbines. And then uh, under construction and expected to be fully operational is high wind tampon. And that's going to be 88 uh, megawatt wind farm. Half of it is already operational. The rest uh, is under construction should be fully operational by the end of this year. Um, and so it's expected, we're really right at the beginnings, it's expected to grow quickly over the next uh, decade and beyond. All right, so some of the initial types of floating wind platforms have been borrowed from uh, the oil and gas platform configurations. And so these floating platforms tend to be really massive, relatively sturdy, uh, which of course is a good thing, but the really massive part leads to expensive platforms uh, because a lot of material needs to go into constructing them. And so there's a lot of effort now to try to bring down the cost of floating wind energy by trying to reduce costs. And one part is trying to make it less massive in the platform. And that of course makes it more challenging from a controls perspective. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the substructures or the platforms of these first two uh, floating wind farms, High Wind Scotland and Wind Float Atlantic. So High Wind Scotland has five, six megawatt turbines on what are called spar platforms. And Wind Float Atlantic has three 8.4 megawatt turbines on what are known as semi-submersibles. So these are actually floating turbines. You can't quite see into the water, so you can't quite see what's going on underneath. Um, and so I'm gonna use this artist's rendering so that we can see sort of what's going on underneath. So a spar platform achieves stability through its deep draft. Okay, but the downside here is that most ports are not deep enough, so you can't assemble the turbine at port and then bring it out. So typically you have to transport all the parts and assemble uh, this floating uh, wind turbine out at where it's going to be located. Now, the advantage of the semi-submersible is it distributes buoyancy across a wider plane. 
it has a shallower draft. That shallower draft means that wind turbines, these floating wind turbines could be assembled at port and then just dragged out to where they need to go by a regular tugboat, which is what happened in the Windflowed Atlantic project. And this advantage is making semi-submersibles relatively popular. Now, one of the downsides of semi-submersibles is because of that wide kind of plane that's above the surface of the water, it's exposed more to the effects of waves. All right, so what I'm gonna do is uh, talk just a little more background on control of land base and fixed bottom wind turbines, and then talk about some particular challenges with floating offshore wind turbines, and then hopefully have time to just briefly cover some of our work in multi-loop control approaches for floating offshore wind turbines. Then I'll summarize and briefly point out some areas of ongoing and future work. All right, so I pointed out some of the key components of of wind turbines earlier already. So essentially, in a nutshell, the way wind energy works is the wind comes into the rotor plane, and because of the aerodynamical design of the blades, that wind comes in, it generates lift that causes the rotor to spin. That'll spin the low speed shaft. And if there's a gearbox, that speed is stepped up onto a high speed shaft. And that'll spin the generator, generating electricity it's put on the grid, transmitted to users. Now, there are two key operating regions that we're gonna to refer to. So, and I'll try to explain this in the context of a 2.5 megawatt wind turbine example. So here we have power as a function of wind speed. The wind power available is a cubic function of the wind speed. And when wind speed is too low, uh, it's considered that the friction and bearing losses are great enough that it's not worthwhile to operate the turbine. Only when we exceed what's called this cut-in wind speed do we move into what's called region two operation. And there that's often also referred to as below rated operation. The goal is to try to maximize power production. And the controller that's active is the generator torque controller. Essentially it's trying to decide how much power to pull off the turbine onto the grid. If it pulls off too much power onto the grid, it'll slow down the rotor speed too much. If it pulls off too little power onto the grid, then the rotor will be spinning too quickly. It's trying to find that optimal aerodynamic efficiency point to try to maximize power production. Now, the maximal power coefficient for most modern utility wind turbines now is about 50%. So it's capturing about 50% of the power available in the wind. Now, as wind speeds increase further, we'll move into what's called region three operation. And once we move into region three operation, we're already at the rated power of the turbine. And so this is now called above rated operation. And the goal now is to try to regulate power capture at that rated power of the turbine. And the main controller that's active here is the blade pitch controller. Essentially, as wind speeds continue to increase, the blades will be pitched more and more to let more wind go by so you can regulate that power at the rated power of the turbine. And additional control goals are to try to minimize structural loading so that the wind turbine will, will last 20 or more years. All right, so kind of the basic feedback control loops for the wind turbine are as follows then. So wind speed comes into the rotor plane. It's never completely constant wind speed coming into the rotor plane. There's typically a bunch of turbulence and usually there's higher speeds uh, higher off the ground. Okay, and so uh, when we're in below rated wind speeds, the generator torque control is active. The main quantity that's measured and fed back is the rotor speed and that generator torque controller is trying to essentially uh, find the most aerodynamic efficient operating point to maximize power production. As wind speeds increase and we move into region three, then the blade pitch control becomes active. It also uses the rotor speed measurement and it essentially is actually trying to regulate rotor speed at a desired rotor speed. Once we move into region three, the uh, generator torque controller basically becomes just uh, uh, basically applying this constant rated torque. And the hope is that in region three, that constant rated torque times the desired rotor speed gives you the rated power of the turbine. 
All right, so just briefly, some of the work that my group has done over the last, I think, almost 15 years is looking at combined feed forward and feedback control of wind turbines. Uh, when I first got into this uh, area of work, I was really surprised that wind speed measurements were not actually used by the controllers. Um, so our group has worked with uh, atmospheric scientists and remote sensing experts to look at the using uh, LIDARs for measuring incoming wind speeds. And so LIDARs can be mounted in the hub or on top of the nacelle. They'll scan ahead and measure that incoming uh, wind speed information. So this preview information about the wind speed can then be used to improve both the blade pitch controller and generator torque controller to better kind of maximize aerodynamic efficiency and also better regulate uh, the power at rated uh, power. Uh, and also uh, one of the big things that has been shown is that that preview information can really help to reduce structural loading on the wind turbines. Now, there is a third control system on wind turbines, and that's the yaw controller. So usually uh, the yaw controller uses wind vane measurements, and if there's kind of a persistent error in the yaw of the turbine, the yaw controller will become active, usually trying to make sure that the wind turbine is facing into the wind. So LIDARs also measure uh, wind direction quite well. And so that LIDAR information, that LIDAR preview information can also be used uh, by the yaw controller. All right, so the focus of this talk is not on combined feed forward feedback control. I just wanna point out some of the areas that we've worked in. All right, so getting to then uh, floating offshore wind turbines, there are a number of challenges. First of all, some of the nonlinearities uh, are kind of not very well understood. There are also much lower frequency flexible modes. Um, these platform uh, flexible modes are at very low frequencies. In general, a lot of the floating platforms are still, the configurations are still varying. There's a lot of investigation of different types of floating platforms, really trying to reduce the mass of these platforms. And so as a result, there's a lot of poorly understood dynamic characteristics of floating wind turbines. There is a pretty well uh, agreed upon pitching, uh, platform pitching instability that exists in floating offshore wind turbines. And so this uh, instability occurs in above rated conditions. And so that's when the pitch control is active, okay? And so essentially you have this platform pitching motion, okay, that occurs. And so effectively, if the platform is pitching forward, that effective wind speed coming to the rotor increases. And so the, the, the controller will see this increased wind speed, will pitch the blades further to let more wind go by. And that reduces the rotor thrust, causing the turbine to pitch forward even more. So you can see that that kind of causes this instability. And really what's happening is there are non-minimum phase zeros. So these non-minimum phase zeros actually do exist in land-based turbines and fixed bottom offshore turbines as well. But there, in those cases, they're associated with the tower modes, which are at higher frequencies, usually outside the bandwidth of the controller, so they're not as detrimental. With floating wind turbines, the platform uh, modes are the ones associated with the non-minimum phase zeros. There are very low frequencies, usually within the bandwidth of the controller, hence causing these issues. All right, so uh, we have developed low order models of uh, floating wind turbines where the dominant poles are these three poles and there's these two non-minimum phase zeros. And, and so the collective blade pitch controller that I refer to, that predominantly is a proportional integral controller. And so draw the root locus as a function of the overall gain. And if we choose the gains that are typically used for land-based or fixed bottom uh, wind turbines, then we end up with a linearized closed loop system that's unstable. Turns out that the full nonlinear system doesn't topple over, but it, it gets into a limit cycle and really just kind of uh, has a lot of structural loading that's not good for the system. Now, of course, the initial uh, work that was done in this area was just to detune, just to reduce the gains so that these unstable poles move back into the left half plane. And that, of course, helps to uh, increase 
stability. But then the drawback of that approach is that the generator speed tracking becomes worse. And so it's not regulating that generator speed and hence regulating the power as well in uh, region three. So I'll talk about this uh, US float uh, wind turbine configuration a little more in a bit. Um, but what I'd like to do is just kind of give a little bit of a selective walk through some of the earlier control work in floating wind turbines. So Larsen and Hansen and Yonkman, about 15 years ago, they're one of the earlier researchers in this area. They pointed out this platform pitching instability. They pointed out a possible solution is just to detune, reduce those gains to uh, gain stability. Now, uh, Vanderveen and others uh, used nacelle or tower top velocity feedback into the blade pitch control loop. Now, this is used also for land-based and uh, fixed bottom wind turbines. So for floating wind turbines, you can improve the performance. You can kind of decouple that uh, the rotor dynamics with the platform dynamics and also try to increase the platform damping of the closed loop system. But fundamentally, you still have the same non-minimum phase zeros. And we all understand that when they're non-minimum phase zeros, there are limitations to achievable performance. Now, Fisher fed back uh, the nacelle or tower top velocity to the torque control. And so instead of just applying that constant rated torque, there's an, another additive proportional term uh, as a function of this tower top velocity feedback. And by feeding back to the torque control, you can actually change the dynamics as seen by the blade pitch controller. In particular, you can try to move those non-minimum phase zeros. Now, the drawback is that once we're in above rated conditions, we already have rated torque being applied. If we try to add further uh, torque, there's a really limitation how much headroom, we, how much more torque we can actually use because we'll hit the absolute maximum saturation limit. Uh, and so there's a limitation how much we can move those non-minimum phase zeros. Now, Fleming and others, they fed back nacelle uh, in tower top velocity to the blade pitch controller, and they also fed back platform pitch velocity to the blade pitch controller. They use kind of a frequency separation approach in how they try to uh, mitigate the vibrations at the tower top and the platform pitch. So the tower top velocity is at a higher frequency, the platform pitch velocity is at a much lower frequency. So they kind of did this frequency separation approach. And then uh, you and others, they fed back platform pitch velocity to both the blade pitch controller as well as the generator torque controller. They also pointed out that by feeding back to the torque uh, controller, they could change the dynamics as seen by the blade pitch controller. And they also try to move those non-minimum phase zeros. They also pointed out the limitations in that you very quickly get to that absolute maximum torque that's allowable. So uh, there have been uh, multi-input, multi-output control methods that have been, been applied for floating offshore wind turbines. And some of this, initial work um, is, is very useful. Essentially what they do is they assume some model of the floating offshore wind turbine, and then they apply these techniques. Now these techniques haven't really been adopted by industry. Um, there's some dependence of these approaches on having an accurate model of the wind turbine. And there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot not very well understood about the dynamics of floating offshore wind turbines. Also, these approaches, they tend to generate controllers where it's difficult to really understand why a particular controller might be working well or not. So you don't really develop uh, intuition and better understanding necessarily of uh, the coupling and, and uh, uh, how, why, why things are working well. And industries has been really, really uh, kind of hesitant to apply these uh, approaches. And talking with industry, they say they prefer maybe just first do kind of these single loop closures, really understand why things are working well before going to these more advanced techniques. Um, so let me kind of just highlight this uh, ARPA-E project that we were fortunate enough to be on. This was uh, part of the phase one Atlantis program at ARPA-E. Our project was called the Ultra Flexible Smart Floating Offshore Wind Turbine or US Float. And so basically the US Float consists of 
uh, the Danish Technical University 10 megawatt reference turbine. And that's on top of a novel lightweight, uh, what we call spider float substructure. So spider float refers to the substructure and US float refers to this floating wind turbine with the DTU 10 megawatt turbine on top of the spider float. And part of the goal of this project was to do structural control co-design where we were really trying to aim to reduce the mass of the spider float platform in order to reduce the cost of the overall US float in order to drive, to drive down the cost of floating wind energy. So just to give you kind of context of, of size, the DTU 10 megawatt reference wind turbine has a power height of about 120 meters. Uh, the blade lengths are approximately 90 meters and rated wind speed is 11.4 meters per second. So below that would be below rated, above that is then above rated where the blade pitch controller is active. And that's where we focused on because of that platform pitching instability. What we found is that the typical below rated controllers for land-based and fixed bottom wind turbines actually work reasonably well for floating wind turbines. So for the spider float platform, there were many, many uh, designs, but our final design uh, was, is as shown here, there, there's a stem that's 30 meters long, 10 meters in diameter. There are three legs, uh, 35 meters in length, three meters in diameter. And then there are these buoyancy can units. There's seven cans in each unit. Uh, they were of 19 meters in length and each can 5.3 meters in diameter. And so I think most of us are uh, under two meters tall. So you can see just kind of that, how large these wind turbines really are. Now, the spider flow was designed kind of to be modular it's for ease of manufacturing. These buoyancy cans are attached to the legs uh, by universal joints. And the reason for that is to try to dissipate the effects of the waves before they hit uh, the tower. And so you can see it's semi-submersible inspired. And the goal is to try to really reduce the mass as much as possible. Um, and so there is the challenge of this uh, uh, platform is that there's very low natural hydrodynamic damping, which can make uh, it challenging for control. All right. So in our kind of literature search on the methods as we embarked on this project, you know, we noticed a lot of uh, work where they focused on a single loop, tuned a single loop without necessarily worrying about how it affect other loops. And so they were ignoring coupling. And so there, there were very heuristic approaches. There were kind of advanced control methods that were applied to floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, they tend to depend and trust uh, an accurate model of a floating wind turbine. They were algorithmic. They somewhat abstract. Sometimes, you know, the resulting uh, controller may work well, but we didn't necessarily fully understand why. And so we try to take a middle ground. We're trying to work towards maybe a structured LQR or H infinity approach. Um, but we started off by doing single loop closures, trying to understand couplings across the loops and trying to then understand how to jointly optimize uh, the control gains across the loops. And so really sort of where things were at the beginning of the project uh, is that there were multiple projects. There was a two-year project, multiple teams were funded. We were working with a structural dynamicist on their, our team. They were constantly changing the platform. We went through dozens of uh, platform designs. And then the, uh, the codes that NREL develops, NREL has this open fast simulation uh, tool that allows to us to simulate wind turbine responses. NREL led another project in this ARPA-E program where they were uh, working to extend the simulation tool so that we could incorporate the ability to model flexible platforms like the spider float. And so at the start of the project, we couldn't simulate, uh, you know, uh, high fidelity uh, wind turbine response for the US float, that capability wasn't there, that was still being developed. Our team was constantly changing uh, the platform. So we didn't really, we didn't start the project with a model of the US float that we could then use to develop advanced controllers. So what we did is we developed a simplified 
physics-based models, very low order model. We took into account the rotor dynamics, the platform dynamics, platform pitching dynamics, and the coupling across uh, that. And so then we try to understand how the different loops uh, affect the performance. And so this is maybe kind of uh, essentially the same thing as what was shown before. So we have floating offshore wind turbine system, the rotor speed sped back through a proportional integral control loop. That's the primary control loop, but we explored these auxiliary feedback loops where we would feed back the platform pitching velocity either to the blade pitch controller or the torque controller. So we explored sort of how bearing these gains first in the auxiliary loops would change what the plant uh, what the plant was as seen by the blade pitch uh, proportional integral controller. We wanted to understand you know, how much could we move those non minimum phase zeros? What were the trade-offs? Um, we also wanted to understand, you know, could we try to decouple the rotor dynamics with the platform dynamics? Could we try to increase that uh, the closed loop platform damping over the very, very low spider float uh, natural damping. And so I don't have time to get into all the details. So I'm going to just show uh, some of the, the key results. And so we saw this uh, root locus earlier. This was of the baseline proportional integral controller as taken from if this DTU wind turbine was on a fixed bottom platform just simply applying it to the floating case with the spider float platform at just above rated wind speed leads to a linearized closed loop system that's unstable, okay? Um, and it, it, the nonlinear simulation doesn't topple over as mentioned, it just leads to a lot, of, uh, a lot of vibration, a lot of back and forth motion. So it turns out that the non-minimum phase zeros uh, exist at wind speeds that are just above rated. When we get to very high wind speeds, those non-minimum phase zeros go away. They all become minimum phase zeros. Okay, now Lemmer and others at the University of Stuttgart developed a CISO robust proportional integral tuning approach and essentially using exactly the same control structure that just have a better way of tuning this blade pitch controller. They essentially, they're starting with the same poles and zeros, non-minimum phase zeros. And so they essentially uh, ensure some amount of robust stability margin at each wind speed, okay? And so they have a different way of tuning that PI controller. And then the ultimate final gain chosen is such that there are these, these are always stable with some stability margin. Okay, so effectively what they're doing is at low wind speeds where there are non, minimum phase zeros, they're essentially detuning, getting kind of lower uh, generator speed, tracking performance, trading off for better stability robustness. So comparing to the baseline PI controller, obviously that's better than the baseline PI. Now, my student David Stockhouse did all the kind of the detailed analysis and evaluations of how each different gain, you know, what, what, what can we can actually achieve with the different gains? What are the pros and cons? And so then what he did was he did a joint multi-input, multi-output uh, optimization to optimize over the platform pitch feedback gain to the uh, uh, generator torque controller, to the blade pitch controller, and then he also uh, uh, tuned the PI controller of the blade pitch controller. And by better understanding kind of the trade-offs, what happens with the tuning of each gain, he was actually able to tune the feedback to the generator torque controller so that he could actually move those non-minimum phase zeros fully into the left half plane without causing uh, saturation of that generator torque controller. So then, of course, PI controller can be much more aggressive. We can have high gains and not worry about destabilizing the system. And so this leads to much better performance than the robust PI controller, which had much better performance than the baseline PI controller. So if we look at the stability margins, uh, so the baseline is the black line and essentially there's no stability margin when there's the non-minimum phase zeros. And once those non-minimum phase zeros disappear, then we can have some stability margin. The CISO robust tuning 
tries to have some minimum amount of stability margin, it turns out that in the gain schedule at these different wind speeds, there's kind of a sharp change in the gain schedule for the proportional integral gains there. And to smooth out that gain schedule, we actually have nearly zero stability margin right in this region. But overall, we'll see later results. The CISO robust still actually works pretty well. So the MIMO robust now is magenta here. We see that we have uh, quite a good stability margin uh, across all wind speeds for the MIMO robust controller. Now, ultimately, the other team from NREL, they did release an updated open fast simulation tool that could allow us to simulate with reasonably high fidelity our US float uh, turbine. And so we were able then to validate our controller developed on the simplified model on the high order uh, full nonlinear uh, model of the US float. And so we simulated at 12 seeds across all wind speeds. And then the next slide, I'm gonna show standard deviation and maximum peaks of generated speed error and tower loading. And what we find is that the robust PI controller does much better than the baseline PI and the MIMO feedback does even better than that. All right, so the upper plot is the generator speed error. It's normalized to the rated generator speed. So these uh, curves, the solid dashed and dotted are the mean generator speed errors. And then the isolated uh, single uh, dots above are the peak generator speed errors. And so lower is better. So we see that the baseline does the worst and the peak errors are consistently above this dotted line here, which is at 20% above the normalized, above the um, rated generator speed. And so that's generally the threshold that's considered if you go beyond 20% above the rated generator speed, the turbine's actually gonna shut down because it thinks something is wrong. And so then you lose a lot of power production every time the turbine needs to shut down. And so that looks like the baseline PI controller would cause a lot of shutdowns. Now the CISO robust is the green line. So the mean generator speed errors noticeably better um, and the peaks never get above 20% above rated generator speed. And then the MIMO robust does even better, especially in these lower wind speeds in region three where there are non-minimum phase zeros for the CISO robust system. Okay, the lower plot shows tower loading. It's the tower base 4F bending moment. Um, and again, lower is better. And here it's also normalized. So we're just looking at lower is better. Um, so the baseline has the highest average um, tower loads and the peaks are the highest. With the robust PI, we have lower average tower loads and the peaks are lower. And with the MIMO robust, we do uh, better all the way across for mean tower loads and overall uh, lower peak loads as well. So the MIMO robust is able to achieve noticeably better performance than the CISO robust, which with these noticeably better performance than the baseline PI. We're trying to still further understand some of these trade-offs. We wanna actually uh, 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 kind of verify this technique for other floating wind turbine uh, systems for which we can get models of. Okay, so in summary, uh, floating offshore wind is coming. It's gonna come very fast and it's gonna grow uh, quite rapidly over the next several decades. There's a lot of active research in the design of floating offshore wind turbines, in particular, trying to drive down uh, the mass and cost of the substructure. There are a lot of uh, MIMO control approaches for floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, our initial approach has been trying to carefully evaluate each loop, analyzing trade-offs, trying to lead to an effective and intuitive MIMO control approach. And we've tried to automate uh, the tuning of our MIMO uh, uh, control approach, and we are trying to kind of validate on other floating offshore wind turbines. In ongoing and future work, U.S. float phase two has been, we've been verbally told that it is being funded. We're still under contract negotiations. It looks like it'll take several more months. But what we'd like to do is to do full aerostructural control co-design where we're allowed to modify the turbine design as well as the substructure design goal is that we believe by doing so, we can minimize the cost of floating wind energy even further. Now, 
Um, we also, given some of our past work, are very interested in some combined feed forward feedback control of floating offshore wind turbines. And so in some of our past work, we've looked at using LIDARs to measure and estimate that incoming wind. Essentially, we're trying to measure and estimate kind of the wind disturbances coming in. We've actually did, done some initial work with the Stuttgart group in looking at uh, using LIDARs on floating wind turbines where we essentially, you know, the, the LIDARs mounted on the nacelle and we have to take into account the floating motion to back out actually what that wind speed that's coming in is. And we were able to show reasonably good results. And in this initial work, we just focused on the wind disturbance. We assumed we were in calm water. So we did not take into account any wave disturbances. So we have interest, and there are a number of other groups now working in this area. We have interest in trying to predict and, and the wave disturbances that are coming in. So radar, LIDAR, floating buoys that are upstream, or even floating wind turbines that are upstream are essentially sensors that can tell us what uh, the waves are doing as they come into the downstream turbines. And so my student, David Stockhouse, has actually did a class project in a class where he used kind of uh, past uh, measurements of the wave elevation to predict kind of the wave elevation in the future. So it can do well in the near future. As we get too far into the future, it starts to have larger errors. So this is preliminary work. We are hoping uh, to uh, do some further work in this area. And so another area that's uh, already very active for land-based and fixed bottom wind turbines is control of wind farms. And so what typically happens on wind farms is each turbine is controlled to be as greedy as possible, trying to produce as much power as it can. And the hope is that overall, the wind farm will produce maximum power. But it's relatively well agreed that that actually doesn't happen because wind turbines interact with one another through their wakes. And so as this lead row extracts power from the turbine, wakes are generated behind it. There are lower wind speeds in the wakes and more turbulence in the wake. So these rear turbines can't produce as much power because of the lower wind speeds. They also get beaten up more structurally because of the turbulence. And it's been shown that by coordinating the control of the individual turbines, accounting for the wake effects, that you can actually lead to more power production across the wind farm. Now, there, for floating wind turbines, a big question is how do wake propagates behind a floating wind turbine? Intuitively, because that wind turbine, the floating wind turbine is moving, it seems that it would dissipate the wakes faster behind it. And some initial work in this area does show that that happens, but it's still very preliminary and there's still a lot more work that has to be done to sort of really uh, validate how wakes dissipate behind floating wind turbines. But if it turns out to be true that wakes dissipate faster behind floating wind turbines, then floating wind turbines could have a lot of advantage over fixed bottom offshore wind turbines because for the same layout in deep water, uh, the, a floating wind farm could produce a lot more power than a fixed bottom wind farm. And another avenue of, uh, that's really fascinating, I think, for floating offshore wind turbines is that you know, these floating wind turbines, they can move around, they are tethered through these mooring lines, but they can be moved laterally slightly. So you could, depending on the prevailing wind conditions, you can try to relocate a little bit each of the wind turbines to improve the layout for the current wind conditions to further optimize power production on a floating wind farm. So uh, just a shameless plug for any of you going to the American Control Conference this year, we did organize a tutorial session on the control of floating wind energy systems. It'll be on Thursday, June 1st. So we will talk about for a general overview, floating wind turbines, trade-offs on the multi-loop controller. Another group is going to talk about combined feed forward feedback control of floating wind turbines with LIDARs. And there is a group that has actually done quite a bit of very nice work on repositioning of wind turbines in the floating setting to improve that wind farm performance for floating wind farms. All right. So I'd like to thank in particular ARPA-E for funding uh, the US Flow Project, getting us involved in the control of floating offshore wind. And I'd also like to uh, acknowledge a number of other sponsors of our work in the general control of wind energy area.
Um, the US float team has been fantastic to work with. So Mario Garcia Sanz was our uh, RPE program manager. Uh, Sanu Cernivas and Rick Damiani, they're the inventors of the spider float concept. Katie Johnson is a controls collaborator. Eric Loth is also a collaborator on this project. And I'd really like to uh, thank my research group. It's been a lot of fun working with them, but in particular, I want to thank David Stockhouse, who really provided a lot of the material for this talk. And lastly, but not least, thank you for coming and for your attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I've seen some work in the, uh, it was, I guess about 10 years ago, Matt Wagner and uh, 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 Mario Rotea did some work on, on tuned vibration absorbers, uh, placing them in the nacelle as well as in the, the floating base. <laughs> And uh, I'm curious about uh, VF's thoughts on uh, that versus your uh, uh, new robust control approach to uh, suppressing some of the uh, uh, yeah. cycles. Yeah, so we were trying to use the existing actuators on the wind turbine, not adding any new actuators because uh, the initial studies are by adding actuators, that's adding a lot of cost, okay. uh, right? Yeah. So uh, when you were presenting the, the pitch instability, I, I formulated two ideas in my mind, uh, both um, a little bit on the crazy side of the spectrum, <laughs> probably. But I'm just curious if anyone's uh, looked at them. And, and they don't include uh, replacing the tower with the tether, but uh, definitely uh, <laughs> thinking about it as well. Yes. But these two crazy ideas uh, were, were thought of. So my understanding is when you're doing pitch control, you're pitching to feather, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're feathering, you're reducing, dramatically reducing the lift and the drag acting on the, the blades. Um, and, and you get the, that instability that you were talking about. Um, but I was thinking, well, could you in this circumstance actually pitch in the direction of stall, which would increase the lift acting on the blades, but it would also increase the drag even more so. So yeah. the L over D actually goes down the higher lift means you have a higher thrust coefficient, the instability goes away, the rotor slows down as it should, you've got higher loads because right. the, the, I'm curious, has anyone looked at So we did in, in our evaluation, that's why I didn't want to go through the details, but we've looked at different signs in these things exactly to, that, to, to, to do that, to kind of do the opposite, right? Yeah. To, and, and then see if we can compensate for other effects from the other gain, for instance. So, so we have looked at that. Uh, yeah. To, to some extent, then not to say that there's still a lot more that could be done. Uh, and so basically, you know, these are basically the simplest feedback loops, right? The primary feedback loops, proportional integral, and these are just proportional gains onto the, that platform velocity feedback. And of course, uh, we could look at, you know, sort of more complex uh, controllers that maybe do even more uh, in the way that you're talking about. But you have to be careful with kind of those trade offs, right? That, yeah, you should try to reduce that platform pitching instability, yeah, you want to kind of do the opposite of feather, right, pitching the stall, but then you have to still account for, yeah, the, the overall stability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so crazy idea number two was, um, uh, I'm, I'm so reassured by the fact that you're looking at the, <laughs> some of these, and maybe I'm not that crazy, but crazy idea number two was, um, could you employ individual pitch control whereby you, you feather, but you only feather at the uppermost portion of the, uh, the, the wind turbine stroke so as to actually, even though you're feathering, uh, no, wait, do you want to do the opposite? I guess you want to do the opposite. You want so, to feather, yeah, yeah. feather at the bottom. bottom. Yeah. So, so even though you're feathering, you're actually increasing the overall pitching moment because at the upper section of the, the stroke here, you're generating right. a larger force. Yeah, so, so we have, uh, looked at individual pitch control, there, uh, the trade-off is the power production. Um, and so we don't want to be doing too much of that to lose power. Um, but yeah, I was kind of thinking yeah. you're in region three, so you're, you're just trying you're to above. target rated power at that point. Right, right. Yeah, but it's, it's a little complex because depending on how much motion uh, there is. Um, but we are actually just kind of at the beginnings of looking at the individual pitch control. We've largely more looked at it in terms of structural load reduction. Um, but uh, 
yeah, haven't completely uh, worked on it from the point of this uh, platform stability issue. But that's a really good point. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thanks for uh -huh. the great presentation. Yeah, great. Okay, so Brent, then you and you. Okay, yeah. So a great talk, Lucy. Okay, thank you. You didn't mention you didn't mention waves, but you didn't mention the tension on the boring line. And not that I would add more actuators, but I was just curious, what is modeling a part of that? Yes. So so as part of our project, we did uh, briefly look at uh, platform actuators on the, the US float. We looked at actually um, buoyancy can. Yeah, so we looked at um, we looked at tension actuators on these cables. We looked at buoyancy can kind of letting water out, letting it fill up so that we can then change the tilt of the platform. We did also look at mooring line actuators. The, the rough conclusion from all of that, like the tune mass damper, is these actuators would cost a lot. And so it's not completely clear that they will help in the operational control, because they will also necessarily, for the most part, be very low bandwidth actuators. So they might not necessarily help in the operation of the US float. They might ultimately be needed for the floating wind turbine to survive these really ultimate extreme cases where the wind turbine is actually not operational, but just trying to survive kind of hurricane conditions and such. All right. Um, yeah. You showed us a map of. Uh, for wind speeds, is that map expected to be accurate for the next several decades? That's a great question, right? With climate change, you know, what is going to happen? Uh, this is what they're using right now. Uh, obviously, they probably have to continue to refine and, and remeasure. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, how that's going to so change. Are you familiar with, like, over the past even 10 years, how much the, that map has changed? No, I have not. So I think this map is actually relatively recent. I don't know whether there was an older map, right? In terms of at least floating wind, uh, deep water wind, this map was actually just recently created. And I don't know that there was one before. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you talk about MIMO control, it seems it's much loop. It's multi, yeah, it's multi loop control. We're trying to kind of understand sort of the each loop's effect and um, then, yeah, and then kind of tune control. each one, yeah. But uh, you could say your torque control can change the plant, uh, get rid of now mean run phase zero, and uh, for the control core design, the structure design, the which we can achieve similar effect. Right, and we did go back and forth with the the structural dynamics uh, a bit, and that we don't have a full understanding there, so I, I don't actually have any conclusions of. Uh, of things there. Usually every iteration had many changes to the, the platform. And so we couldn't nail down necessarily what one change might have been leading to, to some of the dynamic changes. But that's in, yeah. Okay, thank you. In the in the simulation, you showed the floaters, there's such kind of motion, right? Mm -hmm. right? Let us floater more than the the turbine was this year. And the float motion can we have energy from the float motion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's something we can talk about later. Yeah, there is definitely quite a bit of uh, these buoyancy can motion. Yeah, so if you can harvest energy uh, from that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, we have one here. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I'm uh -huh. curious, uh, what, would have, what does it really mean if the normalized turbine loading uh, for the baseline goes above water? Because we are talking about normalization. Normally yeah. Uh, yeah. So here we were normalizing. I, I don't know how this normalization was changed. I can't remember now, but we we're normalizing to this value. So this one was at one. And so so then these other ones were were above one. So in general, lower is is better. It was just happened to be normalized to this particular okay. value. Is that like the uh where the region two goes to region three. Oh, so this is all region three. So this is all above rated. Region two was down here, yeah. Uh, and when you mentioned the uh, phase margin uh, of the seasonal robust, uh, you mentioned that it was a uh, uh, change like that. Uh, yeah, so in the gain schedule, there's some sharpness uh, around here if you look at the gain schedule for the proportional integral control. And so because that was smoothed out and that got rid of the margin that originally had, had been there. 
Yeah. And then Jeff. Yeah, this may not be an, an issue at all, but I'm just thinking, I mean, if you really have that significant uh, of a, uh, a pitching motion, you have to deal with procession events. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just going to start to rotate. Uh, so we have noticed, yeah, there there is some yaw that that happens there, uh, but uh, and that is something. So we've primarily looked at four aft motion. So we modeled rotor dynamics in this platform pitching motion. We did not include in our dynamic model uh, kind of side to side motion. We did notice that there was some side to side motion. There's not a lot of control authority that way, but we we didn't account. That's, that's yeah, that was right. My follow up question: When you have a really flexible floating uh, platform, it seems like it, it starts to precess. It'd be very difficult to recover. Yeah. So there, and so that work um, that's been done by this other group in terms of repositioning the turbine, you can you can kind of you know yaw and then reposition. You know, so so those are the sort of things that we're looking at to try to get back to the original location if, if needed. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you. That's what I'd like to do. Thanks. Based on company agents, based on the you again. Yeah. That's so nice, especially a few years later. Yes, yes. You know, at the time, sometimes students were like, oh, there's so much work. Yeah, yes. uh, but I, I really appreciate that. So okay. it's great to see you. Great to see you doing well. So good luck in the PhD program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice to talk to her. I've had some talking with you. Yeah. 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 Okay, I will. I mean, yeah. You know, whenever we see each other, you know, we always talk about Chinese school and how our kids complain about Chinese school. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, This neuroscience area is you know, and it's really a problem that you know, you really are, but you know, some of the other stuff she talked about was. Um, Insect locomotion. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of, there is a lot of, you know, um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I like Okay, so. Yeah.
Okay, then we need to need this. Yeah, a lot of opportunities to kind of strategize the best way. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I really like that. Thank you. That's the kind of thing I like to do is multi loop systems and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. We definitely have cheap ridiculous. What is your idea of cheap? Thank you, thank you, thank you. See almost all the cookies. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm always I was like a little bit done. Okay. Good. Good. Because I gave some of them. Actually, gave that up. This is two years of audience. Okay. 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 Okay.